this morning. It's an honor to have you here, and we're glad you're here. And not only are you welcome today, but you're welcome every Sunday as well. We are here to honor, remember, and celebrate 71 people that you have met through their photos who have had lasting impact on us as individuals and on Western Home Communities as an organization. These are mostly residents, a couple of friends of the organization, and one dear Western Home employee. We want to take this time to say thank you again for allowing us to care for your loved one. Whether it was for a day, a week, a year or more, your loved one and your family had an impact on us, and they're now part of a long and rich Western home history that we are very proud of. But we are also here for you. We are here to recognize, witness, and support the grief you have are and will continue to experience because of this death. Your loved one was unique, you are unique, and your grief is unique. Wherever you are on the roller coaster of that grief journey, we get it. Not how it feels to lose your loved one, but how it feels to work through the emotions, fears, frustrations, and sadness the death of a loved one leaves. We grieve too. We hope this service is one step on that path, one step to a deeper understanding of how your grief pays tribute to your loved one. In the back of the room, there are some print resources that are available to you. Please know that any of our employees are available to you as well as you walk through this path of grief. Following this service, there'll be some light refreshments in the lobby to your right as you go out this door. Our employees that are here would love to reconnect with you and greet family members who are present. Thank you again for coming today. We have the joy of singing together, and we will begin by singing this first hymn, O God, Our Help, in ages past. In, in essence, it is a poem about time. God stands above human time. And so when the events of the day bring anxiety, bring worry, the God of the ages remains our eternal home. Let us sing together.
delighted that you're all here, whether you're a regular attender or you're a first-time person or you're coming back here to the Western Home. Freshman worship on a Sunday morning is a place of word and worship as we turn our hearts to the Lord to have Him bless us through what He uh, says to us through His word and as we have the opportunity to respond to Him uh, through our worship. So again, we're delighted that you're here. Um, we have a few people that have been coming here regularly, and uh, I want to charge uh, those regular folks a little bit. Look around here. We'll spend a little time. This is an important part of a service like this because it's also about fellowship. So why don't you introduce yourself to someone, especially someone that you might know. Let's spend a little time introducing and welcoming each other and telling someone that you thank you very much. You may have a seat. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jerry Harris. I'm the president of Cedar Falls Operations. I didn't know how hard it is to kind of get the group to settle back down. That's okay. Uh, we are um, very, very pleased. Is that, the, is that better, Carolyn? <laughs> Carolyn's back here doing one of these. <laughs> We're very, very pleased to have you here today on, on this special day. And uh, first of all, I just want to thank Carolyn Harris and uh, her leadership for dreaming about putting this sort of program and these resources together um, for our residents and families and employees. And, and she's done a, a wonderful job with that and dreaming about that. And there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, folks like Vicki Neeson, who has a desk actually in her office um, and does a lot of the work. And then tie that in with the spiritual care team that uh, that uh, just helps so many of our folks um, through this journey. And so we are appreciative of that. For some of you, for some of you family members, this is your first time back on campus. And it can be a, a little bit of a scary time, and a sad time, and a joyful time. Um, but let me know, that, uh, let you know that we are glad that you're here. And we're glad that you've taken that step to be here. And as Carolyn said, there's many different steps. For you that are residents that are here every single day and you live on this campus, um, one of the things that you will experience and that you will get to be a part of is you will start meeting new friends and neighbors and reacquainting yourself with folks that you knew years ago. But on the flip side of that, you also get to be a part of the journey and the loss. And so um, we don't go lightly without recognizing you as a big part of this journey of living here and being part of this Christian community. For our staff that had the opportunity to see all of these names and you look back and you go, there's no way that we could have lost that many folks in six months here. The reality kind of strikes. Um, we have a work, work, uh, workplace page, it's kind of like a Facebook, and we put the names up this week. And I can't tell you how many times I walked as I walked around this week, and I know many of our staff did too. Of the folks, of, I can't believe all those folks that we took care of. I, I, she was just here. He was just here. But a lot of times, those d discussions throw a tear, but most often they throw a smile and they throw a joy, and they throw a giggle sometimes as we um, reminisce uh, the opportunity that we've had and the blessing that we have has had as staff members to care for your loved ones. We're glad that you're here today. We are glad that we have this Christian opportunity to gather in a place like this and to celebrate, and we want you to know that you are welcome here, and we're available to you as you hit all of those different stages that we had hit in this journey. So we're grateful for that. We're grateful for the time that you're taking today to spend with us. And uh, we, we're, we're just so pleased to have you here today. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, give us a word of prayer and then uh, we'll get on with our next piece of music. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this place. We thank you so much for the vision and the dreams a hundred and some years ago of people discussing about having a place for folks to age and age respectfully and clearly 
and with love and compassion. And uh, I can't imagine how they're looking down today and just seeing the wonderment of this. We thank you for that. We thank you for all of the caregivers and all the families that have entrusted this place over those years. And we, we just thank you, Lord, for those family and caregivers that are here today, that are in the halls and places working and giving that care 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. And uh, we, be, we ask that you be with them today. Give them the persistence and just the, uh, the joy uh, that they do as far as the caregiving that they have. Yeah, and give them rest too. This work board gets weary sometimes. And, but we're glad that you put it in front of us. Be with our residents, be with the family members today. And uh, just let this be a, a, a joyful time as we remember those loved ones that have gone in the journey before us. And we ask these things in your heavenly name. Amen. I think the next uh, hymn that we'll sing is a favorite of, uh, for many of us. Oh, the assurance, the certainty that Jesus is mine. Let us sing, Blessed Assurance. <laughs>
Remain faithful. Remain strong. Keep trusting in God's wonderful love and grace for them. Because it really never ends. But sometimes as people face that journey, they start to question and wonder about God's love for them. Where's he at? Has he forgotten about me? Is he still here with me? And so we have the privilege of walking with people and helping them to finish with that blessed assurance that we just sang about, Jesus is mine. When they're walking with Jesus, there's nothing to fear. And so I want to read a scripture where the Apostle Paul kind of reminds us of that very truth, that sometimes we wonder, where in the world's God at in all this? Where's his love? Does he really care? Notice what Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? And then he says an emphatic, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then Paul says this, for I am convinced. We want people to be convinced of this truth, that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons Neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither depth, height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we're walking with Jesus, yeah, there might be questions, we might wonder, but the truth is, God's love is never, ever going to diminish or change. So he loves us all the way to the finish line and even beyond to that heavenly home. So let's pause and just thank you for that great truth this morning. Father, we're so thankful that we can gather this morning. We can remember these loved ones that we've been so privileged to care for for, for a long time for many of them. And uh, when we have to say goodbye, it's really a tough thing. But we're thankful that we can just pause this morning and give thanks to you for the gift of their life, uh, for the memories that we hold dear, for the treasure times together, for the ups and the downs that made us stronger in our relationship with one another, but most importantly, our relationship with you. Father, we're thankful that nothing in all of your creation, as Paul says here, can ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in our place that we might have an eternal hope that takes us beyond these few short years on earth and that promises us a home in heaven with you. And so, Father, we just remember these loved ones today. We rejoice in the faith that they had. The journey's over, but really the the life has just begun in eternity, so we rejoice in that today. As uh, we think about our journey with Jesus, we know that he taught us how to pray to you and come to you for hope. And so we pray that prayer together this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. My name is Rachel Harrison, and I am the Director of Resident Engagement here at Western Home Communities. I've had the pleasure of caring for residents in all levels of care since I began my journey here in 2008. For the first five years of my career, I enjoyed leading activities for residents at what is now Martin Suites and then Standard Family Assisted Living. When Western Home adopted the household model of care in 2014, I was one of the first two household coordinators, a role encompassing activities, social services, dining, and obtaining my CNA. It was through this role that I was able to help open uh, the cottages in 2015 and the Deary Suites in 2018. In 2020, I took a leap of faith and transitioned from working in long-term care to independent living. I've enjoyed each of the roles that I've held in my almost 16 years here at Western Home. However, my favorite job title is not one that has been on any of my name tags, and that is Daymaker. A leadership training I attended encouraged staff to be a daymaker, taking someone's average day and making it their best day. Whether it be a resident celebrating their 100th birthday and wanting a Coors Light and chocolate cake, or finding a turkey-shaped hat for the jokester resident to wear on Thanksgiving. Life isn't always about the big celebrations. It's also about the moments that happen on any ordinary day. With the loss of your loved one, your ordinary days look a little different. 
days spent visiting their spouse, parent, or grandparent are now filled with other things. I will encourage you, when the time is right, to go visit the staff. Not only do we miss those that we have cared for after they pass, we miss you, their family. Life is what you celebrate, all of it, even at its end. As we gather here today to remember those that we have cared for, your loved ones, please know it's okay to feel all the things. It's okay to grieve. There's no such thing as getting over your loved one. But also know that even with your loss, it's okay to be happy. Being happy is something to be proud of. It doesn't mean that you have forgotten them. It means that you are choosing to remember them and choosing to do so happily. John 16, 22 says, so with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. On behalf of all the Western Home staff, thank you for the privilege of caring for your loved one. Many of you know this song and just want to share this with you. If you like coming along or singing or mouthing the words, that is just fine. It's such a reassuring thought that his eye is on the sparrow and he watches over every one of us. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely?
Brian and Christy. The song's been around for a little bit. And make no mistake, the song has been a blessing for many generations. Uh, I'm grateful that actually the song is a tradition now. Uh, we, uh, when we started the bereavement program, we kind of launched into hopefully doing a service like this where we would invite family and friends of those that we had the privilege of taking care of uh, over a six-month period of time, and then the pandemic hit, and then we had to kind of uh, put that on hold for a while, and uh, we're grateful that we're back being able to do a service like this. So make no mistake, we're glad that you're here, each and every one of you, and uh, we're grateful that we have the opportunity uh, to do this. We're also grateful that we have the opportunity to hopefully bring a word that uh, doesn't come from a human place, but it's a word that comes from something that God has been orchestrating all along from his heart to yours. And uh, this song that we just sang, I believe even though, well, we'll find out that it actually does come from scripture, but it's, uh, the arts are so powerful. And God is, 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 is amazing in how he creates things. So you have a lyric that's inspired by scripture and then you have someone that can put together a melody, and all of a sudden when they come together, it's done in such a way where you remember. And you're moved. And it kind of like stays stuck on your shoe, so to speak, like a piece of gum, and you're just kind of glad it kind of stays there. And then you have someone like Byron and Christie that can sing it and play it in such a way that there's really no other way to say, but what a blessing. So because singing this hymn is a little bit of a tradition now, and I'm guessing we'll probably continue with it, I wanted to dive into a little bit. Um, I had no really knowledge of where the song came from. So His Eyes on the Sparrow was a hymn, is a hymn, that was written all the way back in 1905. So the hymn is older than the Western home itself. That's a pretty old time. Anybody born in 1905? Okay, just check but it was, born, uh, uh, it, it was born in the heart, the lyrics were born in the heart of uh, Sevilla D. Martin was her name. And the music was written by Charles H. Gabriel. And maybe you want to know what Sevilla looks like, there she is. The only thing I can think of is when I saw this photo, wanted to share it with you, it reminded me of a driver's license photo, you know, back in the day. <laughs> like, smile, you know, and maybe she was. A lot of times, you know, people might be joyful on the inside and you have to tell them, you know, well, remember to tell your face that you're happy. And uh, reading a little bit about Sevilla, I'm guessing that she was a happy person. But remember the old, I think you could smile on a driver's license picture now, but before if you did, they would have to retake it because you have to be serious. So maybe that's kind of what happened with her. I wonder what car she drove. <laughs> But I want to read, uh, this is the story of Sevilla wrote this following uh, to explain the inspiration of where um, this hymn came from as she wrote the lyric. She says this, early in the spring of 1905, my husband and I were sojourning in Elmira, New York. We contracted a deep friendship for a couple by the name of Mr. and Mrs. Doolittle, and they were true saints of God. Mrs. Doolittle had been bedridden for almost 20 years. Her husband was an incurable cripple who had to propel himself to and from his business in a wheelchair. Despite their both afflictions, they lived happy Christian lives, bringing inspiration and comfort to all who knew them. One day, while we were visiting with the Doolittles, my husband commented on their bright hopefulness and asked them for the secret of it. And Mrs. Doolittle's reply was simple. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. The beauty of this simple expression of boundless faith gripped the heart's and fired the imagination of Dr. Martin and myself. And the hymn, His Eyes on the Sparrow, was the outcome of that experience. Amen? So, these lyrics were inspired by Scripture. And I'd like to share with you that uh, the lyrics were, of course, written uh, by uh, this gal, but they came inspired also not only by the events of having uh, met the Doolittles, but Matthew 6.26 26, 26 says this, 
And these are the words of Jesus uh, speaking. And um, uh, it's a part of a section of scripture where Jesus is noticing that it's an easy thing to worry. It's an easy thing to uh, um, uh, get bent out of shape and out of sorts when you're worried about where you're going to get your next meal. When you're worried about uh, what's going to happen uh, to me physically or what's going to happen to my finances or what's going to happen to the things and to the people around me. So it's a section of scripture that I think we would all be good to read. It would be all good for us to read in Matthew 6. But it comes to a head right here. Jesus says, look at the birds. Look at the birds. They don't plant, they don't harvest or store food in the barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And I love how Jesus asks this question. Aren't you far more valuable to him that they are? Now it's not a competition, but birds are being taken care of by the Father. And yet he turns to you and me, human beings, the pinnacle of God's creation, created in his image. Are you not far more valuable to him than they are? Later in Matthew, he brings up the theme again, Matthew 10. What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin, which isn't worth very much. Remember that passage in scripture where the woman came to give an offering and she had two copper coins? And together they weren't very much at all. But she gave them both. So a sparrow really wasn't worth all that much. One copper coin. But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. Think about that. And, the bear, and this next piece of scripture means a little different to me as time has gone by. And the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Big whoop. <laughs> But actually, it is a big one. Every single one of the hairs on our head is known and numbered by God. And then Jesus says this. So don't be afraid. There are a lot of things to worry and grieve about. Don't be afraid. Don't let these things consume you. And again, why? Because you are more valuable to God than a whole flock sparrows. Make no mistake. Make no mistake. Soak up this next sentence. Our value. Your value. Every single human being's value in God's eyes is immense. It cannot be measured. However huge you can imagine it being, it's even bigger than that. Isaiah 43, 4 says, Because you are precious to me, you are honored, says God, to you and to me and to his people. And I love you. There are people that moan the fact that they don't have people in their lives telling them that they love them, especially a parent friend. Well, here's the God of the universe saying to you and to me, I love you. Romans 5 eight. But God showed his great love for us. Now we're going to get specific. This is how he showed it. This is how it was tangible. By sending Christ, his one and only son, to die for us, for you and for me. And he did it while we were still sinners. He has done this for us because he loves us when we were in a condition that was unredeemable. When we were in a condition of not even remotely wanting to pursue the things of God. That is actually a sinful, that is our sinful and fallen condition. We don't really want to have anything to do with God. Not on our own. <coughs> As we're going to see, this is actually the work of God to do things in and through other people, in and through a word. We'll talk about this because he wants to tap us on the shoulder to remind us of this immense value that we have in his sight when he sent his son Jesus to die a perfect, spotless, sinless death. He came back to life and he did all of this while we were still 
fully in, in incomplete rebellion because of our sin. I want to ask you a question. You don't have to share with others, but as you can, be as honest as you can in your own heart. And what would be the most honest answer that you would give to these couple of questions? The first one is, I want to ask you, when you need comfort, when you need strength, and I'm guessing we all have an idea when we feel depleted and when all of a sudden we're at the end of our last uh, rope, end of our last rope, end of our rope. Where do you go for comfort and strength when you have very little of it? Is there a habit in your life? Is there something secure and steady? Where do you go for comfort and strength when you have very little of it? Now let me ask a follow-up question. Where have you gone for comfort and strength? How'd that go? If we're honest, I have gone for comfort and strength to friends and family, to things that I enjoy, a guitar or a fishing pole. I'm grateful for journeys towards something that I can find some joy in. But if you're anything like me, I have stories of looking for comfort in the wrong places, especially in the aftermath of the loss of my dad, of a loved one. You ignore grief at your own peril. Hopefully you've heard me say that before. And there was a time in college and in my past, and it's a part of my family, but that's no excuse. But where drinking felt like the place that I could find comfort. We're doing behavior that I know mom would say, what are you doing? If she found out at all. So if you, in your own journey, and we crave it, especially when we're depleted, comfort, strength, just to be able to take the next step, where do you go? Where have you gone? And as I was looking up statistics and articles on this, you know what the most common answer to this question actually is? Where do I go for comfort and strength? <laughs> Nowhere. And just ignore it. And keep it to myself. I don't want anybody to know, especially if it causes shame and embarrassment. So make no mistake, I want to declare this. God wants you and me to have, in all capitals, comfort and strength in some of the most difficult seasons of our journey. God wants us to have comfort and strength in difficult times. In three ways. That's what I'd like to spend the rest of the message talking about. Here's how, very specifically, He wants us to have the comfort and strength that He desires us to have and He can equip us to have for the journey that we might have in our time left on earth. Through His Word, through his spirit and through his people. So finding comfort and strength. I hope this is none of this is uh, uh, too strange or, or, or that you've never heard this before, but I just want to argue let's not ignore this incredible gift that has been given to us, which is God's word. We have the Old and the New Testament, and all of it can actually be used for uh, by God so that we can find in difficult times comfort and strength. And let me just read a few that came. I didn't want to spend too much time in this and see what would come up, come up to, the, to the four. But Psalm 119, 105 says this. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. It's good to spend time in God's word because he wants to guide us in our journey. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. And this is a special verse in my heart because this was one of my dad's favorite passages. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Again, shortly after my dad's passing, I'm grateful to have bumped into my mom, who was at home with her Bible, and she was reading the Beatitudes. And as I walked in, she had some tears in her eyes, and she said, what a wonderful verse. And she read this. She was reading it actually in Spanish. Blessed are those who mourn. 
Blessed are those who mourn. There's probably mourning in this room for the loss of a loved one, even the loss of a job or the loss of something that's going on in my body, for the loss of whatever it might be. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. A few more verses. Revelation 21.4 says this. Here's the promise. Revelation is looking ahead at the future that God has revealed. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Hallelujah. But not yet. Psalm 23, 4. We have these banners that we put up for today. And this is a, a very uh, common uh, a piece of passage of scripture that's read especially at funerals and memorials. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you, God, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And also 1 Corinthians 15. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. What comfort and strength may you and I rejoice in. Because our sinful state leads us to the kind of death that is eternal. Where we will be forever depleted from any comfort and strength that God would want us to have. And he says, I love you. I'm going to send you my son. And he will be known as the new Adam. And as we're invited to put our faith and trust in him, so in Christ all will be made alive. Perfectly replenished. Perfectly strengthened. In perfect community and fellowship with God. So we find comfort and strength through his word, but we also find comfort and strength through his spirit. So very briefly, I know in my church tradition, um, there wasn't a whole lot of teaching around the Holy Spirit, maybe a little more so in yours. And I don't know if we can completely understand how describe how God reveals himself to us. And I'm going to say these words, and I don't think we can grasp its full understanding, but hopefully enough that we can get it a little bit so that the light bulb goes on. But God reveals himself to be a triune God. Three in one and one in three. Three in one and one in three. Whoa. I think I get it. I can kind of grasp it. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So through his spirit, that's one of the three parts of God. We talked a little bit about the Father, the Creator, and we've also talked a little bit about Jesus, but here comes his spirit was just as important. So through his spirit, we are also meant to find and receive comfort and strength. John 14, 16 says this, I will ask the Father, this is Jesus, and he will give you another what? Oh, isn't that great? Comforter. He's making a comforter available for you and me who will never leave you. But let's complete the picture. Romans 8, 9 says this, but you are not controlled. And by the way, Paul is writing and he really wants Christians to grasp this. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. So he just did something. There's going to be people that are going to be trusting in Jesus and there's there are going to be people that aren't. There are going to be people that are filled with the Spirit and there are going to be people that are not. Remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them, they do not belong to him at all. Now that might sound like a, bit of a little bit of a scary verse, but let me unpack it just briefly. God is always wanting to reveal himself in such a way you'll go out for a walk and you'll say whoa check out this nature this is amazing how could this possibly have been created by accident he's inviting you to say yes 
to his ways from the outside in. And hopefully we all have a chance to hear what the good news that's found in Scripture. And the good news is that Jesus came to die on a cross. For you and me, because of his resurrection, we have that same hope of being alive forever in the presence of God. Not by what we do, but by through faith in him. And as we say yes to that whisper of the Spirit, all of a sudden the miracle happens. In the old days, the God, lived, God lived outside in a temple. But in the New Testament, he says there's going to be a new temple, and that temple is actually going to be the hearts and the lives of each and every person who invites me in, who says yes to him. And my spirit is constantly at work at that. So I want to ask you, is that something in your own life that you have said yes to? And just so you know, He's not done. As long as we have breath, he's going to continue to remind you that the reason I want you to say yes to me is because I love you. Because I want to give you my comfort, my joy, my hope, my strength. When the indwelling of the Spirit happens, when God takes all of a sudden, the hold of our lives. And Paul says we have to actually invite that almost every day. I die to myself so that God can live within. Here's what happens. We have a different view of suffering. When I'm on the outside of God's plan for my life, I tend to go, oh, this is so bad. This stinks. God must be a jerk. He's just a killjoy. He just wants to snuff out. We can have all kinds of conclusions. But here's what happens. As God starts to make his way and mature us, and by his spirit we begin to, begin to grow in our knowledge and our acceptance of him, all of a sudden we have a different view of suffering. You know what? Maybe this is something, this is something God's using to make me stronger. To make me more aware of my need for him. Have you had that experience? Not that we are overjoyed at the fact of all these terrible things happening. But let me tell you, some of the strongest Christians I know are the ones that have suffered the most. But by God's grace, by His Spirit working in, with, and through, they'll still say, Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, the guy that wrote this verse was exactly that kind of a guy. Paul said, would you please take this burden away from me? Would you please take this thorn in the flesh? We don't know what it was. Maybe he had a hump. Maybe he couldn't walk. Maybe he was blind. We don't know what it was. And yet God, alive in Paul, through his spirit, gave him this answer. My grace is sufficient for you. And those are good words for us to hear. In the midst of any trial, in the midst of any tribulation, in the midst of anything that might be depleting us of strength and comfort, His grace is sufficient for us. Last but not least, God wants us to find comfort and strength through His Word, through His Spirit, but also through His people, through other followers of Jesus. Do not ever underestimate a kind word. Don't ever underestimate a moment of conversation that's seasoned with encouragement that comes from and to a fellow believer. 2 Corinthians 1 4 says this, and it's also Paul writing, He, God, He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we, as we are comforted, we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. My dad used to say that in some ways, the life of a Christian is one honest, legitimate, cool, whatever you want to call it, but real story after story after story after story of what only God can do. I don't think God could have. 
I don't know. Only God would have led me to Cedar Falls. I'm a big city kid that grew up in Mexico. Thanks be to God that I'm only God could have led me here to the Western home. Only God could have done what? That's, those are the stories that we share and we tell with one another. And as we share these openly and honestly, what happens is we're able to encourage and be encouraged by others. So make no mistake. I want to end with this statement. In God, in Christ, and through the Holy Spirit, and through His Word, we're able to find comfort for today. And let me tell you, I would like some comfort for today, and I'm asking him for that. As we speak, my mom is in the hospital. I don't know how long she'll be there. What will happen after, I don't know. But there is comfort for today. Until the last day. When will that last day be? Some of us are here because there already was a last day of a loved one. Comfort for today. Make no mistake, that's what God wants to give us. Today, until the last day, and far beyond, into eternity. By His grace, and His love, and His truth. Again, thanks to each and every one of you for being here this morning. I pray that this time will be blessed. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word, your spirit. With the encouragement that comes from other believers and from other people. Thank you that you can do something deep in us that only you get the credit for. And I pray that we would give testimony to that. Father, I pray that we would allow ourselves to be mindful of what it is that you're asking us to do. Forgive us when we have either ignored or where we've gone other places for sources of comfort that aren't connected and tied into the good news of the gospel, into the restored life that we can have because of what has been done for us at the cross. Father, I pray that we would pay attention to that knock. And when there is clarity around what we are being asked to do, which is respond favorably with a yes, Lord, you're asking me to surrender. And I've said no so many times, but I will now. Help us remember that there is such an incredible celebration that goes on in heaven. Father, thank you that in many ways services like this, we know that there's for those of us that remain. Father, I pray that you would continue by your spirit, by your word, and through conversations with people to be reminded that you want us to say yes to what has been gifted to us in Jesus. Thank you for this time of worship. Thank you for this time of word. Pray that there'll be good conversations that happen after the service. Thank you for the privilege of the ministry that the Western Home gets to do. Thank you that we're uh, encouraged to share the hope that we have in Christ here at the Western Home, and we, we continue to do that uh, thank you for your amazing grace and love for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Together we say it. Amen. You know, doubt, uh, there's no doubt that you know our last hymn, Amazing Grace. And... Um, it's not just theory, but it's a testimony of a man who was transformed by God's amazing grace, by believing in this grace that is offered to each one of us. So as we sing it, let's just receive his grace by believing, as this testimony says in this hymn. Let us sing, Amazing Grace.
Amen. 